The Things They Carried, Chapter 17, Part 2. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross stood 50 meters away. He had finished writing the letter in his head, explaining things to Kiawa's father, and now he folded his arms and watched his platoon crisscrossing the wide field. In a funny way, it reminded him of the municipal golf course in his hometown in New Jersey. A lost ball, he thought. Tired players searching through the rough, sweeping back and forth in long systematic patterns. He wished he were there right now, on the sixth hole, looking out across the water hazard that fronted the small flat green, a seven iron in his hand, calculating wind and distance, wondering if he should reach instead for an eight. A tough decision, but all you could ever lose was a ball. You did not lose a player, and you never had to wade out into the hazard and spend the day searching through the slime. Jimmy Cross did not want the responsibility of leading these men. He had never wanted it. In his sophomore year at Mount Sebastian College, he had signed up for the Reserve Officer Training Corps without much thought. An automatic thing, because his friends had joined, and because it was worth a few credits, and because it seemed preferable to letting the draft take him. He was unprepared. 24 years old, and his heart wasn't in it. Military matters meant nothing to him. He did not care one way or the other about the war, and he had no desire to command. And even after all these months in the bush, all the days and nights, even then, he did not know enough to keep his men out of a shit field. What he should have done, he told himself, was follow his first impulse, in the late afternoon yesterday, when they reached the night coordinates, he should have taken one look and headed for higher ground. No excuses. At one edge of the field was a small vill, and right away a couple of old Mama Sans had trotted out to warn him. Number ten, they'd say, evil ground. But it was a war, and he had his orders, so they'd set up a perimeter and crawled under their ponchos and tried to settle in for the night. He remembered how the water kept rising, how a terrible stink began to swell up out of the earth. It was a dead fish smell, partly, but something else too. And then late in the night, Mitchell Sanders had crawled through the rain and grabbed him hard by the arm and asked what he was doing setting up in a shit field. The village toilet, Sanders said. He remembered the look on Sanders' face. The guy stared for a moment, then wiped his mouth and whispered, shit, and then crawled away into the dark. A stupid mistake. That's all it was, a mistake. But it had killed Kiawa. Lieutenant Jimmy Cross felt something tighten inside him. In the letter to Kiawa's father, he would apologize point blank. Just admit to the blunders. He would place the blame where it belonged. Tactically, he'd say, it was indefensible ground from the start, low and flat, with no natural cover. And so late in the night, when they took mortar fire from across the river, all they could do was snake down under the slop and lie there and wait. The field just exploded. Rain and slop and shrapnel all mixed together, and the field seemed to boil. He would explain this to Kiawa's father, carefully. Not covering up his own guilt, he would tell how the mortar rounds made craters in the slush, spraying up great showers of filth, and how the craters then collapsed on themselves and filled up with mud and water, sucking things down, swallowing things, weapons and entrenching tools and belts of ammunition, and how in this way his son Kiawa had been combined with the waste and the war. My own fault, he would say. Straightening up, First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross rubbed his eyes and tried to get his thoughts together. The rain fell in a cold, sad drizzle. Off toward the river, he again noticed the young soldier standing alone in the center of the field. The boy's shoulders were shaking. Maybe it was something in the posture of the soldier, 
or the way he seemed to be reaching for some invisible object beneath the surface. But for several moments, Jimmy Cross stood very still, afraid to move, yet knowing he had to. And then he murmured to himself, my fault, and he nodded and waded out across the field towards the boy. The young soldier was trying hard not to cry. He, too, blamed himself. Bent forward at the waist, groping with both hands, he seemed to be chasing some creature just beyond reach, something elusive, a fish or a frog. His lips were moving. Like Jimmy Cross, the boy was explaining things to an absent judge. It wasn't to defend himself. The boy recognized his own guilt and wanted only to lay out the full causes. Waiting sideways a few steps, he leaned down and felt along the soft bottom of the field. He pictured Kiawa's face. They had been close buddies, the tightest, and he remembered how last night they had huddled together under their ponchos, the rain cold and steady, the water rising to their knees, but how Kiawa had just laughed it off and said they should concentrate on better things. And so, for a long while, they had talked about their families and hometowns, at one point, the boy remembered he'd been showing Kiawa a picture of his girlfriend. He remembered switching on his flashlight. A stupid thing to do. But he did it anyways, and he remembered Kiawa leaning in for a look at the picture. Hey, she's cute, he had said. And then the field exploded all around them. Like murder, the boy thought. The flashlight made it happen. Dumb and dangerous. And as a result, his friend Kiawa was dead. That simple, he thought. He wished there were some other way to look at it, but there wasn't. Very simple and very final. He remembered two mortar rounds hitting close by, then a third even closer, and off to his left, he'd heard somebody scream. The voice was ragged and clotted up, but he knew instantly that it was Kiawa. He remembered trying to crawl through the screaming. No sense of direction, though, and the field seemed to suck him under, and everything was black and wet, and he couldn't get his bearings. Then another round hit nearby, and for a few moments, all he could do was hold his breath and duck down beneath the water. Later, when he came up again, there were no more screams. There was an arm and a wristwatch and part of a boot. There were bubbles where Kiawa's head should have been. He remembered grabbing the boot. He remembered pulling hard, but how the field seemed to pull back like a tug of war he couldn't win, and how finally he had to whisper his friend's name and let go and watch the boot slide away. Then for a long time, there were things he could not remember. Various sounds, various smells. Later, he had found himself lying on a little rise, face up, tasting the field in his mouth, listening to the rain and explosions and bubbling sounds. He was alone. He'd lost everything. He'd lost Kiawa and his weapon and his flashlight and his girlfriend's picture. He remembered this. He remembered wondering if he could lose himself. Now, in the dull morning rain, the boy seemed frantic. He waded quickly from spot to spot, leaning down and plunging his hands into the water. He did not look up when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross approached. Right here, the boy was saying. It's got to be right here. Jimmy Cross remembered the kid's face, but not the name. That happens sometimes. He tried to treat his men as individuals, but sometimes the names just escaped him. He watched the young shoulder, soldier shove his hands into the water. Right here, he kept saying. His movements seemed random and jerky. Jimmy Cross waited a moment, then stepped closer. Listen, he said quietly. The guy could be anywhere. The boy glanced up. Who could? Kiawa. You can't expect... Kiawa's dead. Well, yes. The young soldier nodded. So what about Billy? Who? My girl, what about her? This picture, it was the only one I had right here. I lost it. 
Jimmy Cross shook his head. It bothered him that he could not come up with a name. Slow down, he said. I don't... Billy's picture. I had it all wrapped up. I had it in plastic, so it'll be okay if I can... Last night, we were, we were looking at it, me and Kiawa, right here. I, I know for sure it's right here somewhere. Jimmy Cross smiled at the boy. You can ask her for another one, a better one. She won't send another one. She's not even my girl anymore. She won't. Man, I got to go find it. The boy yanked his arm free. He shuffled sideways and stooped down again and dipped into the muck with both hands. His shoulders were shaking. Briefly, Lieutenant Cross wondered where the kid's weapon was and his helmet, but it seemed better not to ask. He felt some pity come on him. For a moment, the day seemed to soften. So much hurt, he thought. He watched the young soldier wading through the water, bending down and then standing, then bending down again, as if something might finally be salvaged from all the waste. Jimmy Cross silently wished the boy luck. Then he closed his eyes and went back to working on the letter to Kiawa's father.